Welcome everyone to uh, Stanford Center for International Security and Cooperation and a special edition of our weekly research seminar. So my name is Harold Trincunas. I am the deputy director of CSAC uh, and I'll be hosting and moderating today's conversation. Uh, today we welcome uh, David uh, Young um, from the Special Inspector General for uh, Afghanistan Reconstruction. He is a um, supervisory research analyst at um, CIGAR, and he will be speaking to us today about 20 years of stabilization and reconstructions, lessons from the US experience in Afghanistan. Uh, David has extensive experience on um, uh, uh, civil conflict issues, not just on Afghanistan, but across a range of uh, important recent conflicts. He has also authored three major reports uh, for Cigar, um, and he will be uh, speaking to that uh, about uh, about uh, that to us today. Uh, he has also uh, authored numerous pieces for publications such as the New York Times, The Atlantic, and the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, without much further ado, I'll uh, turn this over to David Young. But before we get started, um, please uh, go ahead and use the Q&A function on Zoom uh, to enter any questions you might have. Uh, for Ms. Uh, Mr. Young, uh, we'll have time for Q&A at the end of his talk, um, and uh, uh, I will help moderate the discussion. Uh, you can enter questions in Q&A at any time during his talk. Uh, thank you for joining us, David. Uh, over to you. Sure. Thank you, Harold. I appreciate that. It's great to be here with everyone. Um, so when the Afghan government collapsed, um, the media and Congress spent a lot of time asking us why it happened, uh, and what the U.S. could have done to prevent it. Uh, and these are questions that you know, we're, we're very eager to answer at CIGAR. Congress alone has asked us to write a half dozen reports in the coming months um, that try to help the American people understand exactly what made Afghan government institutions uh, and security forces so fragile. And as you can see uh, on this slide, these are also questions that CIGAR's uh, Lessons Learned program has been trying to answer for many years. We've tried to map out the critical points of failure from the National Security Council on down to the USAID subcontractors actually rebuilding Afghanistan and everything in between. And more often than not, really how those failures cascaded on top of one another. Uh, and as we feared, the, these failures became so pronounced that a Taliban takeover was really inevitable with our drawdown. But to, um, to understand why we failed, we really need to go uh, a little further back in time. When we lost the Vietnam War, our government faced a collective choice of sorts. Um, we could come to understand why we lost, and um, we could commit to reforming our institutions to ensure that we wouldn't make the same mistakes again, and then brace ourselves for the next such conflict. Um, or we could avoid thinking about it altogether and move on to something else. Unfortunately, we took the second approach. Our government insisted that the only thing that we really needed to learn from Vietnam was to just never do it again. And that meant that there wasn't a need to really reform anything. And so across our military and civilian institutions, uh, training curricula and personnel all moved away from rebuilding war-torn countries. And that institutional knowledge and expertise was lost. Uh, so by the time we invaded Afghanistan, we were essentially starting from scratch. But what does, you know, that, what does scratch look like? Uh, well, let's start with a strategy. So if you haven't prepared for these missions, there will be a lot of confusion about who's in charge. You know, um, conceptually, the State Department is best suited to helping rebuild foreign government institutions because that's a, a political endeavor. Um, but state doesn't have the planning capacity for that. They don't train their people in the craft of developing large strategies. They barely have the resources for training on anything except for language skills. And in contrast, with far more resources, DOD spends a lot of time training their people on developing strategies, but you know, and certainly not strategies for rebuilding government institutions in more torn countries. And so that means that after 9-11, straight out of the gate, before anyone's had any meetings or even written anything down to help us think about how we should go about rebuilding Afghanistan, 
were already in deep trouble. And so the strategies were inherently weak. You know, um, every good strategy has ends and ways and means. You know, the, the ends are your goals. The ways are how you're actually going to achieve them step by step. And the means are the resources that you muster to actually go about getting what you want. But because of this problematic division of labor, particularly between state and DOD, the US government couldn't map out a clear set of ends, ways, and means, and frequently uh, based its decisions on faulty assumptions. So our ability to develop these strategies was so inadequate that we didn't fully appreciate just how poor we were at it. The ends and ways and means are all supposed to be balanced and calibrated with each other. The, the ends need to be achievable with whatever ways are available to you. And your means have to be commensurate with what you hope to accomplish. You know, I, I sort of like to think of it as like the, the control room of a music studio, you know, where you have this big panel um, with all these knobs and dials. And if you change one dial by a lot, you have to make adjustments to all the other dials or else the music will sound terrible. And so in our uh, strategic control room of sorts, these components and dials were always misaligned on Afghanistan. For example, we started the conflict with soaring ends and, and minuscule means, you know, uh, rebuild the country on the cheap, replicate the success of the Balkans, which is uh, frankly a much easier part of the world, um, but with a fraction of the troops and resources. So to be efficient and lean, we allied with warlords. Uh, with really little concern for good governance, we prioritized counterterrorism above everything else and ended up um, driving people into the arms of the Taliban. So when, when security started to deteriorate, we didn't question our ways. We just concluded that we needed to supercharge them. So our ends grew exponentially and US officials requested more and more resources to meet the challenge. And it was, it was easy to make the mission more ambitious in this way. And it was relatively easy to secure more funding because you don't need uh, strong American institutions to ramp up the ends and the means. But developing the ways of a strategy requires that you already have these robust institutions for the mission. And we didn't. Building uh, our own institutions from scratch meant that you know, very few people in our government had the necessary experience to question how we were going about doing it and how we would go about doing it. You know, how, what, you know, what our theories of change were and which Afghans we were choosing to empower. And so the, the mission crept along and the ambition grew and we escalated you know, like a reflex. Most US officials seemed to think that we were chasing after insecurity that was um, unrelated to us. It was a problem out there uh, that we needed to fix. But there's considerable evidence that our escalation really just fueled the problem. And that's because we didn't uh, know how to manage the risk of that kind of escalation. Uh, in other words, you know, we built a car with an incredible engine, but no steering and no brakes and no mirrors or seatbelts. And then when the mission struggled for that first decade, we consistently concluded that the problem must be that our engine isn't strong enough. We, one of the biggest reasons that we were really never able to improve this week's strategy and, and then understand what was wrong with our car was that our sense of time was warped. First, we were terrible at predicting how long it would take to build Afghan institutions and infrastructure. You know, everything from the security forces to the electoral bodies to the ring road. And you can, you can see this in official policy documents that worsening security and corruption were simply not expected. So it caught us, caught us off guard when nothing really happened quickly. Second, it wasn't just that we were poor judges of how long things would take. Uh, the timelines that were chosen by U.S. policymakers were often primarily reflections of their own impatience. They often thought that they could just will Afghan institutions into existence. Uh, 
uh, if they just applied enough pressure on every lever at their disposal, if they threatened to withhold the money from Afghan officials, or if they convinced US officials that we'd be leaving soon. And so they thought that if they could convince everyone that the war would soon be over, American and Afghan officials would be motivated to just start making things happen. But when everyone thinks that the war is about to end and they can only see six months or a year or maybe 18 months into the future, they will behave differently, but not in a good way, not with more determination, uh, but with more desperation uh, and concern for themselves often. U.S. officials grew more desperate to create the appearance of progress because they knew they couldn't make actual progress uh, on these timelines. And then Afghan officials grew more desperate to make the most of the American largesse uh, before it was withdrawn. So the speed motivated Afghan officials to look out for themselves, and the immense pressure to make fast progress usually backfired. This, this created um, more corruption as more money was desperately poured in and created more conflict as we spent money in rural villages uh, without really understanding how it might generate more grievances. And so this, this perpetual urgency hamstrung everything that we did. It led policymakers to force a short-term mentality on a long-term problem. And we saw that rebuilding a country is just simply not compatible with urgency. It's hard enough without urgency, but with urgency, uh, every US and host nation institution will really break under the pressure. Now, let's get a bit more specific about how this looked on the ground. The premise of stabilization is that once a community is secured, you lock in those gains by providing social services so that the community feels tied to their government so that they will turn on insurgents and then support their government. And that way insurgents really just can't come back. You know, they, they won't be welcome back. So if you can change perceptions, you can change behavior. This is, this is the logic of it. And, and then you can jumpstart a relationship between a government and a population and, and a neglected population. But your choice in geography is critical in that process. And that's because there are generally uh, two basic models for prioritizing geography within an unstable country. You can start with uh, semi-stable areas and work your way toward the worst places, or you can go straight to the worst places. And we usually prioritize the most dangerous areas first. And to be sure, there's something very intuitive about this. You know, when you see a building that's on fire, your first instinct is to put out that fire. But the stabilization toolkit is just not compatible with firefighting for several reasons. When insecurity gets bad enough, there's really no development-like project. There's you know, a road, schools, clinics, uh, or agricultural advice. None of that is going to convince beneficiaries to change their behavior or turn on insurgents with a certain, once you get above a certain ceiling uh, of insecurity. So, to be sure, they, you know, they, they might appreciate those projects and they might use those projects, but it won't affect their behavior in the way that we hope, in the way that these programs are designed. Instead, we found that you know, these projects really only showed results when the level of conflict was low enough so that the projects themselves can be implemented well, you know, where partners could actually perform the work. And so if if the only way to, to build a road is to bring 25 armed guards to accompany the bulldozers, like you see in this photo in southeastern Afghanistan, then you're probably focused on an area that's too dangerous to change the behavior of residents. And that's because stabilization programs really just cannot fight fires. They can, of course, prevent fires, and they can you know, put out sparks or glowing embers of a fire, but they can't extinguish an inferno. Now, this, this doesn't mean that we should just let those areas, those really, really dangerous areas burn. That's not what we're saying. The US government can, can and does train host nation security forces to put out those fires and to provide physical security for these communities. But we should recognize that as a physical security problem, one that really can't be addressed with um, micro loans or a new well 
And so what this means, if you zoom out a bit, is that it's best to start in areas with a moderate amount of conflict where stabilization efforts can actually have that, that, that necessary impact. And then you can build momentum towards the winning of hearts and minds in, in less secure areas. So that this way, by, by the time you get to the inferno, you have a much stronger political pitch to make to the people who are caught in it. You can say, look at all the progress we have made for your neighbors' communities. Wouldn't you like that as well? Our programs were also seldom tailored to the Afghan environment. We tended to assume that uh, any place where the Taliban had influence, it was because the Taliban were providing services that earned them the community's support. And so we thought we had to basically outgovern the Taliban. But the Taliban wasn't doing a whole lot of governing. They mainly used coercion to earn their support. And so that means the communities that we were trying to stabilize were usually not you know, devotees of the Taliban. Instead, they were simply trying not to get killed by anyone who came knocking. And so any place that was unstable uh, got a project if we could afford to give it. And it didn't really matter what made it unstable. And that's really the problem. We rarely asked the question, why is the Taliban in this community? Uh, is it because they forced their way in? Or is it because they, they are genuinely welcomed? And, and because if they force their way in, the solution is not a stabilization project. You know, that community doesn't need to be won over. You know, they just need basically the Taliban's boot off their throats. And that is just not in the power of a stabilization program. A new road or a training can't compete with coercion. And so if the Taliban is to, if the Taliban can come to that village uh, at night and wreak havoc, it doesn't matter what you do there during the day. You know, that's, that's a problem that only physical security can fix. Sometimes it's really important to note there, the Taliban did provide services and mainly dispute resolution. Um, and that these, were, these services were welcomed by the communities and even prevented civil conflict in many cases. But in these cases, it, it makes a lot of sense. That is when it makes a lot of sense to use a stabilization program to win over a community uh, you know, with social service delivery because they're already getting it from the Taliban because they're already familiar with it. They're already accustomed to it. They're already expecting it. Um, and so if you were to successfully kick the Taliban out of that community, or prevent them from coming in, you know, you're logically taking something away from the community and you need to compensate somehow. And so in those cases, a stabilization project, it certainly serves an important purpose. Unfortunately, in the cases where, we, where it is wise to provide those social services, where you are competing on the terms that the community is accustomed to, we, the, we, we sort of brought a different problem uh, to the table. And that is that we overdid it. We, we built in our own image. You know, for example, in a country where 90% of disputes are resolved um, informally through, through elders, you know, community elders, we spent 90% of our rule of law funding building up the formal justice system that no one trusted, that no one used. So instead of empowering the elders that are already valued and acceptable, we built courthouses like the one in this photo and we trained prosecutors. So we didn't program according to what was familiar and acceptable to these communities. And so very few Afghans used what we built. So we, we seldom attempted to diagnose why the Taliban was in the community in the first place. And we just assumed that every community needed social service delivery. And that was partly because we didn't do the research ahead of time. And that brings me to the next slide. We rarely had a sufficient understanding of local context to program effectively. And this led us to create a whole new set of grievances that often pushed Afghans toward the Taliban. And this ignorance that we practiced was partially because we prioritized the worst places, like I described earlier, and literally could not safely get out and learn about these communities. So we tripped over ourselves with our ignorance. And it was also difficult because we were always in a rush. And we thought that we didn't have time to study these communities um, before programming in them. But there's also a bigger problem 
at work here that really spans the entire US government and goes beyond Afghanistan. And that is that every available um, program dollar is expected to go directly to beneficiaries. And so this idea that I'm proposing um, of doing field research on uh, conflict dynamics or sociocultural dynamics in a, a contested community before actually starting programming, that's proven very difficult to justify. And, but it really shouldn't be difficult because this research is uh, of, what a, of what makes a community tick and what, makes, what drives its conflict um, is a critical insurance policy against making the problem worse, which we often did. So for perspective, we spent $4.7 billion um, on stabilization programs in Afghanistan, and only one program, one $40 million program, commissioned research to understand the local context before intervening. <clears throat> so what should have been, or what should be, a, a standard operating procedure in conflict zones, we only saw in 0.8% of our stabilization expenditures. And the rest of the programs just figured it out as they went, and usually with poor results. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, we also spread our stabilization resources too thinly. The US government has a tendency to showcase its work by counting the number of its beneficiaries. The more beneficiaries, the better the impact, the thinking goes. And so if your goal is development, you know, equitable development, this approach is very intuitive. You, know, you wanna touch the lives of as many people as possible. And that's why Afghan communities rarely received more than one stabilization project. You know, for um, the, the problem though is that stabilization requires building momentum toward changes in political perceptions. You know, one project was rarely enough to change perceptions because it usually felt like like a one-off. Um, and so, changing perceptions required U.S. programs to um, create a more holistic sense in these communities that they're being served by their government and not just getting, you know, like a, uh, like a one-time freebie and then never seeing their government again. And so to have that stabilization impact, projects needed to be clustered and in sequence, you know, something like this, where you concentrate and build up service in one valley or one cluster of communities. And then you go to a neighboring valley or, or cluster of communities and point to the success story in the first area and say, hey, if you guys want this, you need to help us reduce the influence of insurgents by doing X, Y, and Z. And then reward that second valley with its own cluster of services for having done just that. And then gradually expand the bubble from there. You basically have to leverage success in one area to create it in another uh, using political perceptions. Now, this is obviously anathema to traditional development. And that's exactly the point. Sprinkling a country with equitable projects is much less likely to yield that necessary political impact of, of, of winning hearts and minds. So what have we actually learned? Um, just like after Vietnam, you know, there's this very real risk that we will choose not to implement the necessary reforms because it's easier to insist that we won't be doing it again. Um, but there's, there's no reason to think that we can maintain that stance. Um, unstable countries will demand our attention in the future just as they have in the past. We, we will be doing this again. And we're doing it, smaller versions of it right now, today, all over the world, in Yemen and Somalia and Mali and elsewhere. And fortunately, US agencies are showing a real desire to learn. In 2018, they published the Stabilization Assistance Review, which um, spelled out this important division of labor across the agencies for stabilization missions you know, with, with state in the lead, and USAID is the lead implementer, and DOD supporting them. Um, but in, in, in 2019, Congress helped articulate its, its own vision for how agencies uh, should be working in conflict-affected countries with the Global Fragility Act. And, and, and which state is now implementing in five different countries. So USAID has also created uh, a consolidated bureau that, that deals exclusively with conflict. 
So while this realization is there, uh, it's really important to note that very little has meaningfully changed that would allow them to succeed. And it's true that the SAR, the Stabilization Assistance Review, creates this new division of labor. Um, but state aid and DOD have, have said things like this before. They've said who should be in the lead, that state should be in the lead. And it's great to have it as official policy, but you know, the problem has never really been in who we say is in charge. The problem is in resourcing that change so that it has teeth. Because without the teeth, um, the policy may actually worsen the problem. Uh, I'll give an example. With DOD being told that they have a subordinate role, uh, they feel comfortable standing down a bit. You know, U.S. Army's uh, civil affairs brigades are being disbanded. Um, and important uh, educational institutions are fighting for their life. And uh, SIGAR is also really struggling to find DOD training houses that, that still teach stability operations. So meanwhile, as, as DOD stands down, state and aid are supposed to be ramping up their preparations for stabilization efforts. Uh, but that's been very slow to materialize. And it's, it's really not hard to see why. Congress's vision for how we will stabilize conflict-affected countries really appears to be racing ahead of our actual capabilities. You know, for perspective, if you look at the standards set out by the Global Fragility Act, you know, the, the planning it requires, um, the coordination it expects, we had a lot of trouble hitting those benchmarks just in Afghanistan. And now we'll be doing it in at least five countries, um, despite very little you know, having changed under the hood. And so Congress is giving state and aid more money to spend uh, in conflict zones without improving their ability to spend it. Uh, and so I, th I think what's really clear, and this is a, and perhaps a cultural issue of our, of our bureaucracy, state and aid have to be able to invest in themselves as well, not just in the contested communities around the world in which they work. Lastly, circling back to our reports, um, I'd like to close with an observation that is not terribly technical. Um, our reports have a lot of recommendations. And when we uh, talk about them with the agencies, uh, sometimes they say, well, you know, we've explored that idea before, uh, but our bosses uh, and Congress sometimes stop us because they have their own ideas, right? And I'll give one example. In 2009, USAID was planning to spend $150 million rebuilding the agriculture sector in Kandahar and Helmand provinces in the, in the south of Afghanistan. Now, this is an astonishing amount of money to spend on only a few million people in a single year in the climate of as much aid as we were pouring into Afghanistan as, at the time. And our SRAP, uh, Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan, Richard Holbrook, told USAID to double it to $300 million. And so USAID warned him that it would be impossible to spend that kind of money without creating lots of waste and corruption and conflict. And he said, it didn't matter, just do it. And that's because Holbrook himself was under immense pressure to show what state uh, and aid um, could do to build support for the government. And he clearly passed that pressure downhill. Well, USAID was quite right in their prediction. Um, and but what stories like this tell us is that it's just it's clearly not enough to be right. U.S. officials also have to be persuasive and then their institutions have to be designed to welcome those feedback loops so that critical messages and warnings can make their way up the chain. Uh, and then for those messages to then be trusted when they reach the top. And that's really a communication breakdown that's born from textbook political pressure, you know, where US policymakers see a problem and they want it to go away immediately. And it's hard for senior US officials to be told that the, the mighty US government um, doesn't have the power to transform a conflict environment in the next six to 12 months, uh, even if its funding is ramping up or even appears to be unlimited. But unfortunately, you know, state building uh, in conflict affected environments just doesn't work that way. And our government officials need the data and expertise to explain that. And just as important, they need the skill to explain it in a way that is um, understandable. They, so they don't just need to get better at their craft, they need to get better at managing up. 
because in the in the decades to come, a U.S. president is likely to ask state and aid and DOD to invade and rebuild another uh, war-torn country from scratch. And the president may hope to do it quickly and cheaply. And the leaders at those agencies, uh, the, the entire leadership teams at those agencies may prefer to be a part of the solution and not wanna make waves. And so when that day comes, will the staff at those agencies you know, have the, um, have the data and expertise and the collective understanding to put that request in context uh, and to then advocate in a way where evidence would win the day. Uh, and on, on, the cor- cor- on, on the current course, I'm really not sure. Um, but again, it, that's really because we don't prepare for these missions. And so that makes us poorly prepared to explain to decision makers what these missions would require. Uh, both for our own institutions and for the country, the target country. And they, you know, U.S. officials need to be able to explain the risks of even trying to do this, much less failing. And this is precisely why SIGAR's Lessons Learned program was created. You know, if, if the agencies themselves can't or won't prepare, you know, we hope our reports fill that vacuum. To explain, to, to explain the risks of doing so, so that in the future, when, you know, say the National Security Council is deliberating whether to undertake a mission like this, or perhaps more likely, whether to escalate one that's already underway, you know, our lessons learned reports can at least, you know, give them a head start. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there and uh, thank you again for having me. Well, thank you, David, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, we already have a number of questions. Uh, in the queue, uh, which I will read out um, uh, to uh, uh, so the so the rest of the audience can hear them. We typically allow our CSEC uh, fellows, pre and post doctoral fellows, to ask the first few questions, um, and uh, uh, I'll go ahead and start with a couple of the questions we already have while I wait for them to uh, uh, queue something up for us. Uh, but the first question comes from Professor Jeremy Weinstein here at Stanford. He says, there's an almost technocratic orientation in your remarks. In other words, with the right planning, expertise, allocation of responsibility, research, and tactical approach, we could have produced a better outcome in Afghanistan. Is that your view? What outcome do you think was achievable? How do you think about the relationship between what might have been possible on the civilization side versus the challenges the US confronted in building an Afghan military capable of keeping the Taliban at bay? Oh, good question. So SIGAR's approach is technocratic. Our job is to help the U.S. agencies, essentially, you know, to put it really simply, identify what checkboxes would make success more likely. We're in no position to say that had these boxes uh, been checked, success would have occurred, right? Our job is simply to point out problems and identify possible solutions, both for while Afghanistan was ongoing uh, and now for future potential conflicts. So regarding what outcome was achievable, it's very difficult to say uh, one way or another. I think some of the critical mistakes that we made are usually in the early years. And one of the ones that we identified in our reports as perhaps most crippling was this sense that we should not negotiate with the Taliban. And there was this sense that, you know, we've, we basically, the, the Taliban government fell far faster than we, than we were expecting. And it created quite a bit of jubilation across the US government that this was gonna be much easier than we had anticipated. And that gave us the sense, uh, you know, you could call it hubris, you could call it whatever you want, that there was no need to negotiate because essentially, to put it really bluntly, we have them on the run. And that was a critical mistake that, created a lot of path dependency for everything that came after that allowed the Taliban to regroup and build as an insurgency because we did not incorporate them into a post-conflict settlement at Bonn or anywhere else. And so for what outcome was achievable, I, 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 I hate to be to engage in revisionist you know, um, hypotheticals, but to me, given all other circumstances, if we went in with the same poor level of planning, Um, that would have been uh, the key ingredient to make something more likely to succeed. But I certainly couldn't say, um, you know, likely to succeed or 
certainly not guaranteed to succeed. Oh, I think you're muted, Harold. Thanks. It's only been two years and that's still happening. Uh, the next question is from um, uh, Professor Jill Hazelton at the, the uh, uh, Naval War College. Um, and I'll ask, actually allow her to ask her own question. Um, let's see if we can get the audio to work. Jill, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you for this depressing report. As you know, some of us following Afghanistan since 2001 were non nonplus by the failure of the US effort there. I have a comment and a question. The comment, there are at least three fundamental problems with the effort that you don't identify. The first is that the US and partner political objectives are unobtainable. And the second is they were unobtainable because elite survival required maintaining the status quo in Afghanistan. Uh, the third reason is because the effort included little questioning of assumptions, which you did mention, but I think it's, it's, much, it's more of a fundamental problem than you suggested. And then fourth, uh, the political objectives were unobtainable because successful counterinsurgency does not require popular support. It does require an elite compact force through violent competition. The question, which is also a depressing one, since CIGAR was formed in 2008, has anything about the US effort changed based on CIGAR's findings at the strate strategic, the operational or the tactical level? Thank you very much. Sure. So um, a number of uh, CIGAR reforms have been implemented both by the agencies and have made their way into congressional legislation, which we're very happy about. Um, so, and, and that's for both reforms that were taking place and underway in Afghanistan, as well as uh, the perspective of, of engaging in future conflict. So for instance, you know, um, my team had the privilege of contributing substantially to the stabilization assistance review as it was being written. Um, and so that we, you know, uh, we contributed to that. We helped, you know, a, a consensus develop around certain critical issues. One, how long they typically take. And another one just that comes to mind is the importance of, of informal uh, leadership in these communities and, and engaging with informal rule of law because it is in, in the most problematic areas, it is, it is typically what um, it yields the more success or, uh, you know, piggybacking off of the success that is successes that are most likely on the ground. Um, we have, you know, legislation that has made it in, into NDAAs. Um, we have, uh, you know, there have been new policies and practices with anti-corruption, for instance, for, you know, the, um, Congress asked the um, State Department to develop anti-corruption strategies for the countries that it works in as a result of our, our report on uh, corruption and conflict, which was among those that I posted. So there are, CIGAR has a, a long history of providing feedback to both agencies and Congress and having that feedback incorporated into the life cycles of, of their respective uh, work. Um, and uh, I think that it's, it's beyond those technical improvements, some of our hardest thought gains, um, I think are, are yet to come. And that is regarding that critical question of, are we going to allow um, the same cycle that happened after Vietnam so that whatever technical gains are within our power to achieve, are we going to punt on them and say, uh, we'll just, we'll wait until we need them before we ramp them up. And that I think is yet to be determined, but it's a much bigger question and frankly, a much harder lift than the, 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 the more technocratic, as, as one of the previous question suggested, that is, I think, cigars bread and butter, that are these reform, the reforms that we typically advocate for are re realistic, achievable, and, and more immediate. Um, so I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Eric Sapp. Uh, he uh, asks, uh, what evidence is there to think that an imperial intervention, a dominant power or superpower invading, occupying, and restructuring a foreign political entity in a place with markedly different cultural and social practices can ever achieve stabilization? What are the historical models of a successful intervention of that sort? 
Ooh, another good question. I think I would defer to a lot of my academic colleagues on, on that one. That's not something that we spent a lot of time on uh, considering. Uh, thanks. Uh, next uh, question is from uh, uh, Professor Damon Coletta at uh, uh, the US Air Force Academy. Uh, he says, um, not enough to be right. Assuming Cigar was usually correct on policy cause and effect, was it able to navigate the fierce currents of partisan politics? Can specialized professional US government agencies get better at this over time? Can universities help with the effective communications between expert agencies and responsible politicians? Sorry, I, I'm, uh, that was a very uh, dense question. I just want to uh, want to make sure I, it's very compact. I want to make sure I, I'm able to pull it up and, and read it. Um, can I? I'm just wanted to. Can you read it one more time? That would probably help. Sure. I'm pull up the Q and A. Assuming Cigar was usually correct on policy cause and effect, was it able to navigate the fierce currents of partisan politics? Can specialized professional U.S. government agencies get better at this over time? Can universities help with effective communication between expert agencies and responsible politicians? Sure, okay, great. So I'll start with that la the, the last component first on how universities can help. I think that um, some of the, uh, speaking for the way that the, when I was coming up through college and grad school, there was an incredible emphasis on, um, on long policy position papers. Act in, in, in graduate and even undergraduate school, there was a, a lot of emphasis, and I think still across academia, there's a considerable emphasis on helping students become sort of strategists and doing the just enormous heavy lifting of work that is typically not gonna, they're not gonna, that will not land on their desks for at least a few decades. And this is really, I think, intellectually very terrific training, but what where most of these people coming up in the universities are going to be spending most of their time on when they get out of university, either as either graduate school or, or undergrad, is writing much shorter, more compact position papers based on briefings of, of, of extremely complex material so that their supervisors, they can shape the environment for their supervisors. So for the question of how can universities help, I really think that it is much more important to prepare them, uh, students, for the world in which they're much more likely to find themselves shortly after uh, school, which is um, providing support and synthesizing uh, complex issues for their superiors, rather than focusing on the, you know, the, the you know, the, the often more interesting and substantive um, work of, of go, getting through the, the, um, the, the problematic and dense uh, content of, um, of, of higher level strategy and, uh, and, and matters like that. Um, for the first component, the way that SIGAR operates is that we are purposefully objective and nonpartisan. It is crucial for our success that we are viewed not as a political football, but that as an organization that speaks truth to what we find and holds account holds uh, U.S. government officials accountable based on evidence. And so we found that you know the um, it, it's it, it's very normal and common for the the work that we do to be a part of a much larger, broader partisan fight. But we have stayed out of that on purpose uh, because it, it guarantees that we continue to have some influence um, both at the agencies and Congress. Great, uh, David, I wanna take the moderator's prerogative to ask you a question as well. Um, so uh, is there a tension between your advice that um, we should use local knowledge to figure out what it is that communities actually need in a particular situation um, and support local institutions and what the US public will support. So I'm thinking of your example here of, um, you gave the example of dispute resolution and pointing out 90% of disputes in Afghanistan are solved uh, by traditional mechanisms. And uh, yet if we were to support that kind of traditional dispute resolution, presumably, those traditions include a number of practices that are discriminatory of women, for example, or maybe of other minorities. Um, is there a tension there between trying to support local institutions that are acceptable to the Afghan public and what US taxpayers will support as acceptable policy outcomes 
from things that the United States pays for. Yes, there is absolutely tension there. Um, so one of the, it, the question brings to light um, a problem that we experienced, that we noticed over and over again with our strategy. And that is that we wanted such a, a large and diverse number of objectives to be, to be met that we ended up undermining ourselves with all the different objectives. That we worked across, everything worked at cross purposes with something else. And this is a perfect example of that. that that very admirable and understandable desire to protect, in, in particular in a place like Afghanistan, protect women's rights meant that there was tension and desire, let's not empower informal rule of law because of what that would mean for these people. But at the same time, let's build up rule of law that everyone finds corrupt and predatory. And so that the, the tension isn't just between the practice and what US government would want, it's in, in the US government, there is inherent tension conceptually between behind all the different things that we wanted to do. Now, at a more practical level, there are ways to bridge that divide, the one that you described, Harold, and we did it in Afghanistan to a certain degree. There was a program called Rule of Law Stabilization. And what it did, it had a formal component and an informal component. For the informal component, what it did was quite innovative. It, it basically pushed through the tension that you're describing by having connecting elders, and this I'm gonna put this very, very simply, connecting elders to government officials who to, to create that, that, that bond with government and to ensure that those, that those uh, informal practices were to put it gently moderated and to, be, to create a little bit more uniformity in them and to create, uh, to sort of, you know, to, 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 to educate these uh, communities that, and, and to nudge them away from abusive practices as part of their result, resolution of disputes. So it was sort of a, um, a, a one foot in, one foot out approach, where instead of empowering local elders to do whatever they wanted, it was let's empower something that is working well as, a, as an institution while trying to moderate the tendencies of it that are most problematic. And everyone we spoke to described uh, the tension that you're describing, the, the tension that you're describing on this is why we can't promote informal rule of law in many conflict affected countries uh, because of, uh, of this liability. But what they what many haven't recognized or realized is that we did just that we found a way to bridge that gap in Afghanistan. It was conceptually we found it anyway. In practice, it, the, the, the program was very problematic because of all the other things that made every other stabilization program pro problematic. Primarily, it was focused in areas that were too insecure for it to actually be successful. But it wasn't the, the, the rule of law component that was inappropriate uh, or, or ineffective. It was much more rather the, uh, the, lo the geography, as I described earlier, in choosing inappropriate places to program. Terrific. Um, let me uh, go to the next question, which is from Professor David Layton at uh, Stanford. He says, um, I assume the program that invested in local knowledge uh, was the human terrain teams. Is there any evidence that where it was implemented that stabilization was more effective? I think this is in reference to the, the you point out there was only one project that actually invested in developing local knowledge. Ah, yes. No, it was a, an OTI program, office, a USAID Office of Transition Initiatives program that invested in that as part of a program. The human terrain system, which we talked quite a bit about in our stabilization report, and for full disclosure, I was a social scientist for the human terrain system. Um, what we talk about in the report, it's the human terrain system wasn't anchored in a particular uh, development or stabilization program. They were embedded advisors in DOD helping state and aid with advice, but not um, as part of a uh, like a third party commissioned research program, which is where you go into a community or a, a district and develop a large body of knowledge about that community to then help advise specific programs. It just wasn't a, a priority for most development programming, for most stabilization programming. A lot of the human terrain system uh, uh, staff were diverted not to supporting development, but instead to making sure that the US military, you know, to put it bluntly, didn't kick down the wrong doors um, and that were to, to, to help the US military develop a, 
um, a modicum of cultural competence to not step on itself, to not trip over itself. Um, I think there was a second component of that question about the human terrain system. Was, was stab were stabilization efforts more effective where this local knowledge systems were uh, uh, implemented? Anecdotally, we have a great deal of evidence where development practitioners, USAID staff, implementing partners, where they took the time and, 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 and were able to access communities to develop those relationships and understand how they operate, what their conflict dynamics were, where the historical rivalries were, all of that sort of to map out that conflict, where that took place, there was significantly uh, more success, significantly more success in terms of reducing violence and increasing faith in local government. So I wanna uh, ask a, a, a question related to this from Rick Olson, who um, asks uh, for your views on how effective were the provincial reconstruction teams? So um, PRTs are quite the mixed bag. One of the biggest problem, well, conceptually, it is a very neat, helpful idea. One of the best ways that stabilization um, programs and initiatives can move forward is through these ideas, through these sieve mill um, uh, structures. What we often found in, in places like Afghanistan, we've seen elsewhere in conflict zones where stabilization has been attempted, is sort of a spackling of stabilization efforts. Do a little clearing operation over here, do a, do a little development project over here and hope for the best. What is really sound about the PRT model is that it combines, uh, it ensures sieve mill integration am among the coalition side and that it creates it, uh, uh, you know, sort of it, it anchors in uh, the local community and that they, you know, in theory, provide, um, are able to consult and provide more guidance and, and solicit more guidance from communities. Where it often went astray in our experience is just simply by virtue of the insecurity of the places that were, were, were often prioritized and the, um, the imbalance in the civil institutions. So just as an example, on a single PRT, you'd have multiple platoons who provided security. You'd have a civil affairs office uh, that, that provided, that actually staffed the projects, usually with commander's emergency response program funding. And you were, if you were lucky, that team would have a single USAID or State Department advisor, you know, a, a senior civilian representative or uh, an embedded uh, PR, uh, an embedded USAID official or uh, on that PRT. So you immediately you have a, a, a system structurally where military priorities are going to take precedence by virtue of the staffing numbers. And so when the PRT commander, military commander, who's you know was often an air force command, an air force pilot or um, a navy pilot or something like that, would often say, "We want to prioritize this area because our local battalion or brigade wants to prioritize this area." And what could a single USAID representative or State Department senior civilian representative do in that. They can't get out without US military support. All their food, transportation, housing, logistics, they're dependent on the military for it all. And so when they say, if, when and if they said, I think that's a bad idea, we should, we should prioritize this community or this district. Instead, they had very little you know, um, driving them. They had very little support that enabled them to, to, to do that uh, because they were outnumbered, just to put it really simply, outnumbered and outgunned. And so in theory, the PRT model forced civ mill integration in a way on our structures, which is in theory terrific. In practice, what ended up happening is the military subsumed the civilian institutions and that civilian voice that, that, that our interagency has concluded is so critical in moving stabilization projects forward in thinking with a political lens instead of with a military lens, that, that all that, that thinking was sidelined by virtue of this massive imbalance of resources that we talk a lot about in our stabilization report. Let me ask a follow-up question to that, which is um, in one of your last slides, you talk about the the thinking in the U.S. government that, that the state should be in the lead, USAID should be the main implementer, um, uh, and you you talk about this imbalance in resources between, frankly, the Defense Department and the State Department. Um, 
you identify some other structural problems, such as not enough time in a, a foreign service officer's career to uh, acquire additional education or to engage in strategy design. Um, are, are you seeing any appetite for changing that uh, in the US government? Uh, are, are you say resources haven't really shifted, but is that a discussion that is happening or is it drifting back into the, the, the existing imbalance between the Defense Department and the State Department in terms of resourcing and uh, human capital? So yeah, I think it's too soon for me to say that it is drifting back to that. We are not at the point yet where I am, uh, where I feel, I do not yet know, uh, we, 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 there's not evidence yet to say that we are entering the Vietnam syndrome again. We are not, it's, it's just too soon. And part of the reason that it's too soon is that we are seeing interest in reform. The question is, will it be enough, right? You know, SIGAR's recommendations run the gamut from really small technical reforms to try and correct this imbalance to things that are substantially more ambitious. And, you know, it, it really just depends on what the, the agencies are going to have, have an appetite for and what Congress is going to have an appetite for. Because, you know, this, if the State Department says we need X, Y, and Z, if, if Congress isn't interested in it or Congress thinks, you know, that this is a problem, that that, that kind of staffing level or training opportunities are a problem, it's just not going to happen. And so part of our job is to try and raise more awareness about this imbalance and to try and get, you know, traction on it. What we've seen is this, um, in terms of, you know, I'll stick with staffing as one really strong example, staffing as it, and especially as it relates to training. In 2004, um, uh, the Bush administration um, implemented a, a large reform to create this uh, coordinator for reconstruction and stabilization. There was a recognition throughout the government, and it had been building for some time, that state needed to be in charge of these efforts and that it wasn't, and it, and it needed to be equipped to do that. Unfortunately, what ended up happening is that they were given, you know, um, a, a very weak man, uh, you know, incredible responsibility, but very little authority. And so, you know, they had, you know, a dozen or two people to oversee all reconstruction efforts, including Iraq and Afghanistan at the time. And they didn't get any congressional budget. They didn't get congressionally allocated funding for the first four years of the office's existence. So you have this situation where there was absolute recognition that state is not equipped to do what it needs to do. There was a sense of, okay, let's mobilize to get them what they need. The resources that they were given and the authority that they were given were not at all commensurate with the responsibility that they had been assigned. They were unable to then, of course, unsurprisingly, what they had done, what they did with it was unsurprisingly not terribly successful. You know, the civilian, civilians were having trouble to deploy and they were, they were sort of um, not taken seriously in the interagency. And so then, of course, there, the Congress concluded, and I'm, I'm being very broad and, and, and oversimplifying things here, concluded, well, you know, we gave them a chance. They didn't do a great job of it. And so the, the effort was sort of, uh, the, the plug was essentially pulled and, and the effort became the, the, a, a conflict-focused bureau at the State Department instead. Then 10 years later, we're circling back. The, the, the US government, including Congress, is rallying around this need to enable and empower state to do so, to, to take the lead on these kinds of missions. And what the, with the Global Fragility Act, what they're being given is sort of, like I said, funding for disbursements, but not an ability to invest in themselves so that they can be stronger in those invest, with those investments, so they can more successfully engage the world around them in the, in the conflict zones. And so we're seeing this cycle again. And so there's a very real risk here that state and aid with this meager, uh, in my opinion, uh, meager assistance, a meager equipping of them to take on the world with their with conflict affected and conflict affected environments, that Congress and the interagency will again conclude, oh, we gave them a chance with the Global Fragility Act, they didn't pull through, we need to pull the plug again. And then well, you're already seeing a little bit of that, where the Global Fragility Act is being um, uh, the, the, the budgeting for it, the allocated budget for it is being throttled down. And so you're seeing uh, fall, the, um, the us all, the whole government slipping into the same problem again. And so it's too soon to know the, is, is the short answer and the longer answer I, I just gave. <laughs>
Well, David, we're just about out of time. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk and discussion uh, and answering all these questions that were thrown at you. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, sharing your, your knowledge and expertise with us today. Uh, everyone, please join me in virtually thanking David Young at the, uh, at the Spe Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. Uh, and uh, uh, join us again starting in January for future CSAC events. I've put a link in the chat where you can sign up for our mailing list. David, thank you so much. Of course. Thanks for having me. Take care.